For a while now, Paul Mason has been lashing out at any left winger he doesn't deem to be supportive enough of NATO. But emails leaked to the grey zone show just how far that obsession seems to have gone. The leaked emails are mainly an exchange between Paul Mason and someone called Emil Khan, who is the founder of a self-described counter-disinformation organisation. The principal focus of the emails is marginalising the grey zone. Mason and Khan see the website as, as pushing out Kremlin-backed conspiracy theories. And of course, the grey zone, understandably, aren't very happy about that fact. Now, we should be clear, discussing how to expose journalism you think is dishonest or flawed is perfectly reasonable. And the grey zone's reporting is controversial. In March this year, their founder asked, was bombing of Mariupol theatre staged by Ukrainian Azov extremists to trigger NATO intervention? And the Grey Zones reporting on the Syrian civil war took a similar tone. They often suggested that atrocities, which most experts blamed on Syrian President Assad, were in fact false flags committed by groups resisting the regime. So you know, if you want to ask questions about their journalism, feel free. Whatever you think of that website, though, Paul Mason's apparent plotting should be of wider concern. Just take a look at this email. Mason says to Khan, I'm keen to help re -gray zone. If you have any access to resources and expertise, here is what I suggest. A dynamic map of the left pro-Putin infosphere. I made one of the British left Putin influencers that I can share with you, but a more useful project would be to get pro-traffic analysts to map how the different echo chambers interact, where the material begins, and work out who might be pulling the strings. We're talking about this dynamic pro-Putin map. And then he says, I asked two people on the official side who are concerned about this. Does the state monitor and counter left disinfo? And they said no. So Mason has made a dynamic map of what he calls the quote, left pro-Putin infosphere. And it's an issue he's talking to people on the quote, official side about. Now, I assume by official side, he means government officials or people in intelligence agencies. With that in mind, let's look at that dynamic map. Now, this might be hard for you to see, but on the left, you have in big capital letters, China and Russia. You then have organizations like Russia Today, and then some left-wing academics who are, according to this map, supposed to be linked to Russia and China. And we can now zoom to the top right. Remember, this was described as a map of, quote, British left Putin influencers. The key node in this map here is Jeremy Corbyn. You can also see Jess Barnard, chair of Young Labour, MPs like Zara Sultana and Richard Bergen, and media outlets, including Tribune magazine. And you might notice in that top right-hand corner, Navarra Media. According to this leaked influence map, which the grey zone ascribed to Paul Mason, it appears we are exerting pro-Putin influence on the quote, young networked left and on the black community. This image was in circulation for a few days before the article was published, and I, I was certain it was real because, I mean, we talked about this privately, I was certain it was real because only Paul Mason would contrive an image which would include Socialist Appeal, Navarra Media, Conta, which is a, a, a Scottish, school, small Scottish media outlet, Aggressive International, China, Zara Sultana, only he thinks like this. And, you know, there was that connection that we had, which was to the network left and to the black community. That tells me two things. Firstly, the person that created it, I, I think is a racist. I think it's very strange to look at millions of people in this country who are black or Muslim in this bizarre sort of totalizing, generalizing way. That's one thing. And then it's just bizarre. Like Navarra Media, you know, to our detriment, we have... Moya, who's mixed race, who's a presenter. We've got Dali, who's Egyptian. Ash is South Asian, okay? I, I'm half Iranian. We had a, a camera guy, uh, Ghanaian Heritage, who's worked for us a while back. But we're not, we, we're intersectional, but we're not like a black media, or we're not politically black or a black media organization. So I think that tells you something quite concerning about Paul Mason, is that even if you're acknowledging intersection analysis or you're interested in the global south, that means you're reaching out to the Britain black community. I mean, it's just, it's actually deeply politically dis disrespectful to black people, to Muslims, that they would be somehow misled by a, a media outlet like Navarra Media. Like they must be so, they're political sheep. You know, where are the white people? Where's the white community, Paul? You know, it's very, very strange to me. So A, racist and B, highly plausible simply by virtue of how esoteric some of the references were. 
really, really sad. I mean, we could talk about this for far longer. I've known Paul now for 12 years. He was always a, a strange guy, idiosyncratic, but often interesting people are. But in, in the last several years, he really, really has gone on off the rails. And I think it's important to remember this for our, our audience. The guy's a former Trotskyist. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a former Trotskyist. But I think you do get these people in life who need a cause. You know, at one point in his life, when he was a younger guy, his cause was global revolution as a Trotskyist. And I think in more recent years, his cause is clearly counter disinformation. Uh, I don't know, attack the left. I feel like that's partly the explanation. These people, they need a cause. They need to feel that there's a force driving history. They're a part of it. And for a long time, that was probably, yeah, you know, the, the communist slash socialist movement. And now it's something else, something I think, I think deeply inexplicable certainly not progressive. And fundamentally, what he's doing undermines a free society. It's incredibly dangerous. And a lot of the stuff that he's been saying about other people, that they're Stalinists, Paul Mason, you are the Stalinist. He likes to talk about networks versus hierarchies. You are the networked Lavrenti Beria going around making lists of people who shouldn't be allowed to communicate what they think and, and how they view things and understand them. You are an enemy of a free society. And I don't like to use that language. I don't like to talk about people being enemies of a free society. But if you're making blacklists of people and trying to consciously foreclose the public agora in terms of debate around foreign policy, which is what a healthy society needs to do, we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the last 20 years, like in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya, that necessitates a healthy public discussion around foreign policy. You're trying to foreclose that. That makes those things more likely to be repeated in the future. And you're an enemy of liberty. Uh, like I said, I don't like that kind of rhetoric, but that's exactly what he's doing. Let's look at some more of what has been leaked or what has been purported to be the case in, in the grey zone. Because it seems that one reason Mason's apparent obsessions might seem particularly concerning is that the emails also suggest he has a desire to work with the security services. For example, Mason and Khan invited people from the UK Government National Security Council to a secret summit on deplatforming the grey zone. The invitation was declined. In another email, Mason said of their proposed project, what it really also needs is Intel service input by proxy. For example, Bellingcat. Now, Mason's apparent suggestion that Bellingcat receives input from Western intelligence services is itself controversial. We'll return to that a little bit later. For now, though, it's worth noting that it doesn't seem as if Britain's intelligence services are as interested in Mason as he seems to be with them. Mason, however, may have had more luck with the BBC. Last week, he appeared on a Radio 4 documentary called Ukraine, the Disinformation War. As we say in journalism, if one guy says it's raining outside and another doesn't, your job as a journalist is step out and look up into the sky and find out what's happened. Paul Mason was for many years a colleague of mine here at the BBC. Although he's still a journalist, he's also become a left-wing campaigner and he joined Jeremy Corbyn's second leadership campaign. But he became disillusioned with that faction of the Labour Party. These days, he's busy writing books and fighting disinformation. And a few months ago, he was in Ukraine speaking to local activists. He believes if someone's knowingly sharing Russian disinformation, they're acting as proxies for Putin. We have to be prepared to, to label what is happening to a small number, and it is a tiny number, but an influential number. They're actively promoting the talking points and disinformation of the Kremlin. I think that is objectively being pro-Putin. They can sit there all they like and say, oh, I condemn the invasion. But the tell is they're not interested in the invasion. And they never talk about the specific battles, the atrocities. They're interested in the concept of Ukraine being a puppet of an, an American encirclement of Russia. And so... In the world of information, the first question we should always ask is cui bono, who benefits? If my friends in Kiev, who are you know, ex-students, know in uniform, suddenly run out of bullets, what will happen to them? They will surrender, and if they're unlucky, they'll be shot. That cui bono, who benefits from stopping the arms to Ukraine, is Vladimir Putin. Again, that might all sound reasonable on the face of it. It's not a completely bizarre thing to say. But I have personal experience of how widely Mason casts that pro-Putin net. On a recent show on Owen Jones's channel, I challenged Paul on his support for the Labour leadership's demand that left-wing MPs either retract their names from an anti-NATO letter 
or face expulsion. Saying that NATO potentially provoked Russia's invasion. No, no, they didn't say potentially. They said NATO okay. was responsible. So say okay, let's let's start. So saying NATO provoked the war in Ukraine. Yeah. Which I think there's some truth to. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't I don't think that letter was particularly well drafted, but signing it is not a red line for me. Um and if it were, I think I'd find it very difficult to justify it being a red line for me, and it not be a red line for me that Keir Starmer not said. I, I, I believe there should be a state of Israel. He has said that these three of the leading human rights organizations in the world have come out. One of them is Israeli and have said mm. that Israel is an apartheid state because it does these different things. He said, yeah. no, I don't agree with that. No, I think boycott, divest and sanctions would be terrible. And that, well, I, I, I accept you disagree with him there. You disagree with him on that, but you think that's perfectly reasonable and he should be labor, leader of the Labour Party. Mm. A backbencher signed something about NATO that you disagree with and you think that they should be expelled. And what I find interesting is that the only explanation I can find for drawing that line, but not that line, is that one of them is is seen as acceptable by, by the political establishment, by Keir Starmer and the mainstream is, press. No, you see, this is, the, this is the Putin talking point, isn't it? Supporting Ukraine is racist, you know, everybody who everybody who supports Ukraine is really doing it because they this don't support Yemen because they <laughs> Paul, don't support Palestine. This, this is Paul, not, this I, is not remotely the, what I've said in any way whatsoever. Understand my that is the logic that behind the, the point you're making. Now, you saw that with your own eyes. I thought I was, you know, referring to an obvious inconsistency there. Paul Mason disagrees with the Labour left on NATO. Fair enough. And he says he disagrees with Keir Starmer on Israel. Fair enough. But he says only the anti-NATO faction should be expelled. And apparently that means I'm spouting a pro-Putin talking point And I think anyone that supports Ukraine is racist. Like, I don't know, I don't know where that came from. Let's fast forward to the next part of that interview. Do you think that all Labour figures who support arming Saudi Arabia, who are on record supporting arming, arming Saudi Arabia as it carpet bombs Yemen, I'm including people who've supported selling weapons to Saudi Arabia like Luke Akers, who sits on the National Executive Com Committee. And I also mean dozens, and we're talking dozens of Labour MPs who voted in 2016. They defied the whip when Jeremy Corbyn put down a motion, or they can't remember, the motion was on arming Saudi Arabia. Do you think they should be kicked out of the Labour Party? If you support no, the... What? No. What? Oh, okay. okay. You do, Yemen no, is the biggest no, okay. humanitarian no, crisis you, on earth. You do then, Owen. Are you saying Luke Akers should be kicked out of the Labour Party? No, I, no, I'm not. You're the one who's saying people should be kicked yeah, out of the Labour Party. I'm making a difference. Right, yeah, What's the difference? We're, we're, we're Yemen is the worst humanitarian we're, crisis on earth. They they are murdering children in buses we're with bombs some, from Britain. Some understanding here. There are many differences that are containable within the Labour Party. But for me, the difference that says NATO is the aggressor in uh, in the right. Ukraine crisis is not containable because Paul, Russia Paul. is waging a genocidal war. Right. OK. Why? So that's, yeah, that's my yeah. politics. That's my opinion. Why is the life of a Yemeni so much lower uh, than that of a Ukrainian? Go, go again. So, Owen, this is the Putin talking point. No, so what? How, dare you? Is How dare you? Putin Ukraine is racist. Uh, no, because oh, God, God, I, support I support Ukraine. Ukraine. Support Ukraine. Anyone who supports Ukraine I, is okay. raising Ukraine above <laughs> brown people. That's the Putin talking point. Paul, and I want I it. support. No. Now, remember, me and Owen both said we supported the Ukrainian resistance against Russia. If you watch this show regularly, you'll know that's the case. We've also both said the West should arm Ukraine. I think there are reasonable disagreements about what weapons should be sent there, the various risks that sort of different outcomes might pose. But, you know, in general, they definitely have the right to resist. But the mere request for some consistency from Paul Mason meant we were on the side of Putin. Aaron, I want to bring you here. We know that Paul Mason now seems to think it's his mission to out those people who he thinks are on the side of Putin and, you know, to potentially, you know, be sending emails inviting people from National Security Council um, to meetings about this kind of stuff. I know that was specifically about the grey zone, but it does seem like he's casting this net very, very widely, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's not just media outlets, Michael. It's also it's, it's elected politicians and people who hold public office. But Jess Barnard, she's been elected leader of Young Labour. Jeremy Corbyn, Zara Sultana, Diane Abbott. These are elected politicians who are being undermined by somebody acting through uh, secret back channels. It's very, 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 very concerning. And I think for me, Michael, to return to that point of what you're saying, I view personally uh, Vladimir Putin as a huge geopolitical threat. I buy the argument, which I didn't maybe six months ago, actually, that Russian ultranationalism is a huge problem. 
and a concern, particularly for Europe, because we're neighbouring Russia ultimately. It's less so for, for the United States, although, of course, it does impinge its interests abroad. I think it's a major concern over the next couple of decades. You know, he's talking about Peter the Great and the Great Northern War with Sweden and how, you know, how uh, that's a, a template to follow. Well, the Great Northern War saw Russia go into what we today view as, you know, the Baltic states. Those are sovereign states. They're members of the European Union. They don't, they don't want to be part of Russia. So I, I agree that he's a great geopolitical threat. Where I think Paul is deeply damaging, in fact, is that what we need, precisely because Putin is dangerous, is an informed, open debate about how best to address and deal with him. And I think people like Paul for closing that debate, saying to absolutely everybody, if you disagree with me, that's a Putin talking point. Well, how, how do we measure that? How does that lend itself to, to, to informed public debate? How does it? I mean, it's the opposite of that. And like I say, precisely because we didn't have informed public debate at the start of the 21st century on Iraq, on Afghanistan, big historic mistakes were made. We can't afford to do that again. So actually, Paul Mason is critically undermining the thing he claims to be defending, not only regards to democracy, because I view people that behave like this as enemies of democracy and liberty, but actually purely in an instrumental sense in dealing with Putin, I think he makes the job harder, not easier. He looks at civil society, like the conversations we're having now, Michael, he looks at everything as an information war. That is the opposite of democratic deliberation. When there's a democratic society, Paul, and you have to deliberate, one person says something they think, another person says another, you both respect one another's viewpoints, and perhaps you both can learn, and who knows, maybe you proceed forward taking elements of both arguments. That's how democratic deliberation and debate functions. Paul Mason's view of society now on a bunch of issues is about information war. What I'm saying is correct, subjective truth. By the way, this is the Trotskyist fanatic coming out, right? Not the liberal. This is anti-liberal what he's doing. What I'm saying is correct. What you're saying is wrong. You have to be ground into the dust because it's information war. I have to be the victor. You have to lose. And if that doesn't happen, then in some huge Manichaean battle of good and evil, evil wins out because I haven't been able to win this particular adversarial uh, rhetorical debate. Clearly, it is a ridiculous way for a man in his early 60s to be carrying on. But also, like I say, viewing society as a plane of information war, which, by the way, there's a lot of people in these circles that think like that. But the fact that Paul's been caught out, I think, is very revealing. Firstly, it's an absurd worldview. Secondly, this man's an enemy, not just to the left, but of anybody who believes in a democratic society. From that BBC documentary that we, we played you a clip of, what I think is kind of most telling, and in that it sounds anodyne, but it actually has some really sinister implications, because he says, the issue here is cui bono, who benefits? When anyone says anything, you've got to see who benefits. And if you can construe an idea where you know Putin benefits, then that's a Putin talking point. Now, what that reminds me of is the run-up to the Iraq war. Like it, When people are saying, you know, Saddam Hussein probably doesn't have weapons of mass destruction, when they're saying we probably shouldn't fight this illegal war, then you could, you know, people were saying, well, that makes them you know, proxies of Saddam Hussein. That makes them apologists of Saddam Hussein. Why? Because Saddam Hussein benefits from those statements. And it's true, he does benefit from that. You know, Saddam Hussein probably was hoping that the anti-war movement in the West would be successful. Now, does that mean that the anti-war movement in the West was a proxy for Saddam Hussein? No, <laughs> right? Because they, they opposed the war for completely different reasons, right? So, so if you say, as soon as anything that you say could possibly be used by Putin, it becomes, you know, the wrong side in an information war, then that completely takes away any ability to have any rational conversation about anything. And it it will lead to terrible, terrible, terrible foreign policy decisions. Like it's, it sounds anodyne, we've got to look at who benefits, but that question is just so deeply sinister. Finally, let's look at Paul Mason's response. So on the day the Grey Zone published that piece, he posted this Last week, an attempt was made to hack my encrypted and secure email account. The circumstances of the attack suggest it is highly likely that a Russian state or state-backed unit carried out the attack. I have informed the police and the NCSC, the British intelligence organization. Today, materials purporting to be emails and other content from me were published by the Grey Zone, a US blog. In the process, Grey Zone may have risked exposure of my confidential journalistic sources. I make no comment on such material, which may be altered or faked. 
Grey Zone's publication has the effect of assisting a Russian state-backed hack and leak disinformation campaign. That's the Kui Bono thing again. My determination to expose and counter Russian disinformation campaigns and attacks on our democracy is well known. I will not be deterred from this. I urge my colleagues in the labour and trade union movement to remain vigilant against the information war being waged upon us. Since then, he has tweeted this. I'd like to thank everyone who has helped me understand the Russian hack and leak attack on me, including Elliot Higgins of Bellingcat, who are, of course, a 100% independent investigations group and a vital ally in the struggle against disinformation from all states. Now, this appears to be a retraction of his suggestion in those um, leaked emails that Bellingcat receives intelligence from Western intelligence services. That's something that Bellingcat has long denied. Not everyone from Bellingcat appears to be in the mood to mend bridges with Paul Mason um, after this, you know, this controversy. Nick Waters works on digital investigations for Bellingcat and he tweeted, God save us from the counter disinfo Walter Mitty idiots who have no idea how the information space actually works and try and cover up their lack of understanding with moronic charts and references to the <laughs> Intel services. And then someone asked him, ooh, can we name and shame? And then Nick Gorter says, that idiot who got hacked because he didn't have two-factor authentication on his proton mail. So <laughs> two-factor authentication for anyone. I only know this because at Navarro they make us do two-factor authentication on like their Twitter accounts, which I find frustrating. You have to wait to get a text message, which gives you the password before you could log on. Presumably, actually, very useful. I never claim to be uh, an, an expert when it comes to infosec, but Paul Mason does seem to be posing as one. Um, and Nick Waters, who does actually um, work in that sphere, doesn't seem to be very impressed. All of us here at Navarra Media are working harder than ever to keep scrutinizing establishment politicians and the media barons who protect them. We don't have billionaire funders, we don't have advertising partnerships. We're funded entirely by you. If you've ever thought about supporting us, now's the time to go to navaramedia.com slash support and donate anything you can from just one pound per month. Defy the corporate media, join our monthly supporters and help build our supporter base to 10,000 strong.